Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary about the most important news events in our community from Santa Barbara's top journalists and political leaders. I'm Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we look behind these headlines. A new report says the design and safety practices on the dive boat where 34 people perished were unsound. It's cops versus crops as city officials aim to relocate the farmer's market for the new police headquarters. Things heat up on the campaign trail in the race for two city council seats. And new questions surface over the role of federal immigration officials at the county jail, while at the school board from free breakfast to bias training, there's new turmoil. Our panel tonight, Delaney Smith, reporter for the Santa Barbara Independent. Lizzie Rodriguez, member of the Fire and Police Commission. Josh Molina, who covers politics for NewsHawk. And Nick Welsh, executive editor of The Independent. Okay, well, let's get right to it. So Delaney, the Coast Guard's preliminary report about the deadliest disaster in Santa Barbara history is out, and it doesn't look good for the owners of the boat and the crew of the dive boat conception. What does the report say? Yeah, although the ship itself was up to safety standards, it, the report showed that all six members um, were asleep at the time of the fire when one of them is supposed to always be awake at all times on watch. And there's some questions about the design of the boat now, sort of post facto. It was always sort of seen as state of the art or whatever, but that second exit from the third deck where the, where the, the passengers perished, uh, is apparently uh, was not accessible. Yeah, it's a, it's a small opening on the ceiling um, above a three-tier bunk bed. So anyone trying to escape would have to climb to the top of that bunk bed, push open the door, and then physically hoist themselves upwards to get out, um, which is pretty difficult for most people to maneuver. And we still don't know what caused the fire? Nope, and it'll be 12 to 18 months before we do. You know what it was. The theory I find intriguing is it's a lithium ion battery concentration that, that starts lithium ion can't be put out when they when they catch on fire by traditional uh, fire extinguishers you need different chemicals uh, to put them out so once they get going they're really hard to stop all right and then in terms of the legal situation the owners have filed uh, some sort of maritime law of, uh, motion or something what's that about yeah it's a it's a lawsuit that typically um they file after one of the family members files a lawsuit um, but they filed before anyone else did trying to protect themselves from damages um, which would mean they only have to pay the families the amount that the boat is worth and the conception is worth zero, so it would result in a zero payout to the families. Okay, all right. Well, they didn't earn a lot of uh, goodwill with that move, I don't think. Mm. Uh, no, the, for how early they did it, some people are um, saying it's a little heartless, but other people are saying it's standard procedure. All right, we'll wait on it. Okay, Lizzie, uh, the city council has voted four to two to uh, place the new police headquarters, the well, much needed headquarters. Not uh, necessarily, they voted to- Let me finish the question, <laughs> just to dis <laughs> display. Don't interrupt Jerry with facts, Lizzie. Okay, the fact is they didn't vote they to They want to displace the farmer's market. They voted to do an environmental review on that property. <laughs> okay. So that, that's what the vote was yesterday. I think the, the public that came out came out in defense of removing or, or relocating the farmer's market. So I think that was maybe a step or two ahead of what was happening last night. And it was a big, long, forever meeting. It went on forever, and what was the final vote? It was 42. Kristen Sneddon, Jason Dominguez voted to not move forward to do an EIR for that site. The only two not aligned with the Democratic Party, we might say, yes. Merely coincidence, Jerry. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, so, you know those are nonpartisan. I don't know if you knew that. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So they said, let's study other. Let's look at other places. We've been waiting for 15 years for a new police station. We can wait a little bit longer than uh, rush to this site. So that's that's what they were saying. They want look at Earl Warren. Look at. Uh, La Cumbre Plaza as a place for it. Uh, it was a fascinating meeting. Jim Armstrong, former city administrator, came out. Uh, Nancy Rapp, former Parks and Recreation Director, for people who will be covering City Hall for eternity. You know, these are familiar faces. They don't come and speak. So for them to come out, it was a huge issue for them. Uh, former Mayor uh, Sheila Lodge, who, who does speak on housing issues a little bit, 
more. Uh, so jam-packed, room full of farmers, farmers market advocates, farmers market executives versus Oscar Guterres. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because Smedin was clear that she walked in with an idea of how she was going to vote. And then the four-hour process of, of public comment, I think, it clearly changed her mind. The questions she asked were very heartfelt, very altruistic. She would start out by saying, I'm, I'm asking this because I care. And I think the emotion of the farmers speaking about the fear of losing their livelihood, and not just their livelihood, but losing the sense of place, as Bell Hooks would say, a home place, a place where you can have political action while also having a sense of community well-being. So you can go to the farmer's market. Absolutely. You can go to the farmer's market and sign up to, to, to one of the petitions that's happening in town. And you can also go to the farmer's market to buy your flowers and meet a friend but for it, coffee but it's afterwards. Only, it's, it's four hours a week, whereas you got the cops 24-7. Right? You know what, what's interesting is that um, the emotion in the room uh, was really intense, and I think it really does go to that this was sort of a cultural divide moment, or it wasn't so much of a divide, but it was really a cultural moment. And if you happen to be living and working at the farmer's market, and this is the furniture you've been sitting in for the last 30 years, and somebody comes in and says, I want to rearrange the furniture, and you may not be sitting here uh, when we're done, you take umbrage at it, and the farmer's market and what it represents to to the people who go there is really intense. And so they aren't buying it when, they, when the city says, we can set you up someplace else, tell us where you want to go. They're, they're, you know, even though Delegara Plaza is only 10% smaller, um, it's uh, reportedly just not acceptable. Um, and the question I have is, can the city get Delegara Plaza ready and the time it takes. What, what, what time frame are we talking about? I want Nick to tell me more about the tension in the room. Wait a minute. <laughs> you want me to tell you about the tension in the room? I'm going to tell you about the tension in this room. Five years. Five years. Well, it'll be two years if they move forward. Farmer's Market will have that site. It's going to take three more years of construction. But isn't moving the Farmer's Market to De La Guerra Plaza contingent on securing parking from the morning newspaper? Some might say, however, there is a public parking space just a block away. So it's 75 minutes free. I don't think most people spend more than that time at the farmer's market anyway. But the idea is that you keep it downtown and folks will do more shopping, more eating while they're there. The, stor yeah. the story of this meeting, Jerry, was Oscar Gutierrez came unglued when our the, guy. the farmers market people free ride That'll basically do it for you. were 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 saying that he doesn't understand they said nobody from the council ever goes to the farmers market which mm -hmm. is absolutely not true oscar said i've been there he talked about his family being farmers worked in the fields the owner of dune coffee said I live on the west side and pointed at him and sort of called yeah, him out. Yeah, because they're going to be screwed, right? And, and, and he said, you know, well, I urge you to come and walk the neighborhoods with me on the west side. This was the most animated we've was, seen Gutierrez ever. Well, he, was, he was the most animated. He was the most articulate. He was, he, it was like this close to a booyah moment. I mean, he really um, wasn't having any of it. And... At a previous meeting we had, uh, the council had over, uh, he made a very pointed remark about how, uh, you know, where were the brown people at the farmer's market and where were the farmers, you know, the, the Latino farmers at the farmer's market and sort of called out the fact that the farmer's market is like a 98% Anglo sort of event. It's Bernie Sanders. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's a Bernie Sanders, Sanders event. <laughs> and, and so... He really threw down last night. Hey, what about Randy Rouse? Jason Dominguez so, was uncomfortable with... Jason had a couple, a couple issues that he was uncomfortable with, and one in particular was that there was, a, there was a mention that Randy Rouse had been in preliminary meetings with um, Brad Hess and um, Wendy McCall in order to secure... Owner of the Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara News, Press. News Press, in order to secure that parking lot for folks to park during Farmer's Market. His issue is that 
it should be a conflict of interest for him, being that his place of business, his restaurant, is located within walking distance. The popular within Paradise the same. Cafe. It's mm -hmm. an interesting, it's an interesting question. I mean, part of the deal was Brad Hess had tried to get in touch with Wendy McCall and uh, Nipper uh, many, many times and never got a call back. Um, and Randy, who has a long-established uh, relationship with Nipper from restaurant days, uh, had called up Nipper and said, tell you what we're going to do. We will fix up your um, parking lot. We will resurface your parking lot. We'll do all these goodies for you. Are you interested? And what did he get? Crickets. Hmm. Well, so is this a done deal, or is there more stuff that has to happen, or it's pretty There's much... There's more that The has EIR happened. is going to come back, and then they'll be able to decide whether they want to move forward. Uh, it will depend on How long is that going to take? Six months. You I know what know. bothers me about this, though, is... So it, 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 that stupid uh, consultant report that they paid $87,000 for... The Cosmon for, report? Yes, the yeah. Cosmon report. They, you know, talked about how they need a whole plan and everything. And here, once again, they are looking at this little thing as an isolated... You know, move the police station here and, well... This should be part of a bigger discussion about State Street, and we're talking about promenades and closing it to traffic and stuff, and I don't hear any of that. Well, and this is one of the, the issues that, this is the second issue that Jason Dominguez had. He said that we're, that the city, the city is already outbuilt. It's, it's over, it's over um, developed for the size that it is, and he's saying that building to capacity on that lot won't allow the department to grow. It won't allow the building to grow. So he also mentioned that there's, um, there's uh, parking issues and, and so forth. But he was really questioning um, Brad Hess on, is this the, the right place for the future of the what department? What does the chief think, quickly? The chief just wants a department. She wants a new department. She, um, yeah, a new headquarters. Yeah. She, does she want this site? She just wants a site that's safe. She wants a site that's downtown. She wants a site that's accessible for the public and easy for the cars to come in and out when they're going out to And control. for the women cops. For the chief. So and the female <laughs> cops. There isn't a room for the female cops to, to um, they don't have a, a dressing room or a locker room. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. What's going on in the city council races? Well, I watched your, your two forums. Oh, you did? You, Those are you, available, by the way, in podcasts now. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I watched the two you moderated. They were, they were very different. Uh, looking at, I think you could have done a little more to push back on Alejandra Gutierrez. Hey, I'm not running for office, Chief. It's not my job to push back you know, if I, they're attacking the other guy. I watch these, these debates on TV and the moderators going back and forth. They're cutting them off, holding them accountable. Yes, and that's why they're boring. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Jason Dominguez came across as sort of an elder statesman on your panel when uh, Crucito Cruz and Alejandro Gutierrez sort of ganged up on him. Uh, it was sort of unfortunate because uh, Jason, th they were calling him out for the wrong reasons. They were saying things like, you don't meet with your constituents. You don't have enough, uh, you, you haven't done enough to hold uh, meetings. You don't hold office hours. It's like, those people get on, they're not doing that either, okay? Uh, they should be calling him out for being an obstructionist, for going into business for himself on the council. Oh, he said he was a team player. That's for, what was... for, for actively seeking attention for his own issues and not trying to be a collaborative uh, bridge builder. Th that's what you can criticize and, Jason And for, for running for two offices at the same time. You're covering the first, what did you think of the first yeah. district one? Um, speaking of that, I, I thought it was interesting that the um, that neither Cruzito or Alejandro tried to press the issue more that um, he is basically running for two offices at one time. Um, and, and that kind of shows that he's not exactly uh, committed. But uh, like, like Josh said, they didn't bring up how contrarian he is on the council. And he looked completely the opposite <laughs> on your show, actually. You look, if you weren't following city council, you'd look at Jason just from that show and be like, oh, he's the, he's the team player and the other two are the contrarians. That's, well, what, that's what he said at Rotary Club. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a Rotary Club debate. I mean, he came across, um, he's gotten very polished. Um, he's gotten much better at, at the presentation. He's very, he's self-deprecating and um, he's got you know, a sense of graciousness about the other people. Um, 
But he did say that I am, you know, I've gotten much more done than any of the other council members, and he said that. Um, Is that true? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's a hard <laughs> argument to make for anybody. Uh, I think that he also said, you know, I, I tried to step lightly early on because I knew I was a newcomer and I was a new kid on the block, and I tried to be mindful yeah, Jason, of that. Jason, stepping lightly. And, Those are the you know, two things you don't hear in the same sentence very often. That, that was not evident to outsiders watching. <laughs> um, and he took Kathy Murillo to task for accepting uh, pop money, uh, saying she took thousands, if not tens of thousands. Um, he himself, I know, has taken some, I don't know quite how much at this point, but some significant uh, canvas money. So everybody... You know, it's, it's, it's political season, so everybody says everything. But, you know, Alejandra is green, obviously, mm -hmm. as a political candidate, but she is a serious person. I mean, she's very solid. She's doing work in the community. I, you she know, is. I think she, you know, she needs to step it up in I terms of her energy. I didn't know what her issues, what her platform was. After, after listening to and watching the, the candidate forum, I don't know what she's planning to do. What I know strongly is that she doesn't like... Jason Dominguez as the as the district rep. Is that just because of Kathy, her alliance with with the mayor? I just I haven't heard her talk about what what she plans to do and what she wants to to push for. What about the second district? The Mason? So that's looking like a race between Michael Jordan and uh, Terry Jory. It's uh, they're the front runners. They're the most engaged in the community. Jordan's been on the council forever. Or I'm sorry, on the planning commission for a long time. And uh, Terry's really ingrained in the community. And so and they both know have her. money and organization. Yeah, so they're definitely, you know, sort of probably going to be one and two in some kind of order. Uh, Jordan has the Democratic endorsement, which is a big deal. Uh, the other candidates are, they, they are spoiler candidates. They're candidates who are running for, uh, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, they're not running formal campaigns. You have to raise money. You cannot run and expect to win without raising significant amounts of money. And you can't run being a, a contrarian. So Brian Campbell's doesn't like the homeless, okay? Yeah, and that that's, one, that's, 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 all that's going to do is take votes away from another candidate. It's not enough. He but, needs to have more, but more issues. Is that, is that going to pull from Jordan? Isn't See, that going to pull from I mean, Jordan that, that's sort of, I think what the fear is um, amongst Michael Jordan's crowd is that if Brian Campbell keeps raising the homeless issue, the conservatives who might otherwise have supported Jordan... Well, he's going to get a re the realtors in... in and it will go from him leaving Michael much you know, more within uh, striking distance for Terry Jury, who's going to have uh, you know, some uh, neighborhood support, who really, you know, he's, she's very active up on the Mesa, and uh, you know, Democratic women who are not... Uh, beholden to the party for who they support. Um, and it would be, he didn't do that well last time. It was like a 4% turnout. He got 4% uh, Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah. Well, Campbell, I mean, the other thing about, I, I mean, Trump is in the state this week, and he's railing about homelessness in California, per se, San Francisco and L.A. particular. And a lot of the points he's making, the liberal Democrats are, you know, kind of having to, agree with him about, you know, zoning and the way that, you know, nimbyism and so on and so forth has prevented people from building more housing. Um, but I think he also captures a tone uh, that Brian Campbell exhibits well, that people are just like, come on, give me well, a break with this. Brian Campbell overstates it a bit. Though. I mean, he, when you talk about the Mesa being skid row, uh, <laughs> and that was a precise He term. said he, that, yeah. yeah. Um, that just doesn't fly. Um, you know, yeah, you go up to the Mesa and the bus stop, there's always somebody in the sleeping bag at the bus stop, and they, they sleep there all day. And so there's a high visibility of one or two people, but that's pretty much Crescido it. Crescido Cruz is not going to get anywhere attacking Jason Dominguez, and Brian Campbell's not going to get anywhere beating the homeless issue. He's going to have to figure out other issues. Just like Terry, she's sort of, she to, she, she she's involved in the community, so she's going to get a lot of votes. Jordan, and she's the only woman in a five-person field. And Jordan, citywide, would probably do really well because he's super yeah. connected. On the Mesa, um, he's going to have to do more to paint the other three candidates as not viable. Who's doing the most walking? 
Uh, Terry, probably. I don't know, but I imagine that Terry is out there and, and uh, doing her best to get out there. The, uh, quickly on Esparza, you know, he mentioned City College is Luis promote, Esparza. Luis Esparza. He's run for the second time. He took a lot of shots at Michael Jordan. Uh, he said City College is promoting international students and enrollment is going up. But, I mean, he's wrong. Uh, City <laughs> College has stopped. City College enrollment is down largely because of that. So is that true what Josh I would be cautious. I mean, that's an easy fact for him to figure out. So he's talking 2017 yeah, stuff yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and but the feelings oh. of those who don't like City College who live in that district haven't really changed from 2017. Well, the, the issue on the Mesa, of course, is City College it's students housing. who live there. And it spills over into the residential neighborhoods. And a lot of those people have owned those homes for a long time. And they're seeing more and more people... Uh, spill out, uh, Beach City, other developments. So that's a real issue. Uh, they can't sleep at night, loud music, partying. And, and of course, Cliff Drive is, is extremely busy. It's unsafe. The city's redoing it. That's a real issue, far more of an issue than, than, homeless. than homelessness. And what about Tavis? What do we think of Tavis? Tavis is a self-described Young millennial. Man. He's, he's got a great smile. He's got great teeth. I want to meet his dentist. Um, uh, he, he's a, he looks like a really nice guy. He Would you surf? say that about a woman? Never. Mind. He can surf in a suit. He can surf in a suit, but you know, he. He's I mean, he basically said, "Hey, millennial, I represent the generation. Millennial, millennial. I represent the generation for whom the chickens are going to come home. Your chickens are going to come home to roost on my head, and so I want to see Have it you at the seen table. Tavis? You're a millennial." You're an actual I, millennial. I am, I am an actual millennial. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily vote for one, though. Huh? But <laughs> yeah, and, and this is, a, is this the first uh, political race you've covered, the, fir the first district? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, is it fun? Yeah, yeah it's, um, District 1's going to be really fun to cover. I'm meeting everyone one-on-one -on -one next week. And, Tavis uh, will be great in 10 years. Yeah. You know what? He yeah. could be. Uh, I mean, Alejandra will be great in two years. I think Alejandra just needs to sharpen her message. Yeah. And and she then could be, pull off the upset. And she's got the Democratic Party behind her. She's got Kathy Walker. It depends on how hard Jason wants to work, but it's not totally uh, beyond possibility that she could win. Jason does well when people attack him. He comes off looking really good when he's attacked. Yeah, he does. That's yeah. what happened at this yeah. forum here. Right. He has that sort of calmer than you do. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and everybody else looks like they're, they're losing their, their shit. And he is the calm one. And mm -hmm. All right, at the Soups uh, this week, we had a report on the um, presence of federal immigration authorities, a.k.a. ICE, uh, in ter at the county jail. What's uh, And the trend is what? The, the trend is that um, contact between ICE agents, federal immigration agents, and the county jail uh, are down 21%. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, but the actual number of inmates who are delivered from county jail to federal ICE custody is down 72 percent. And is that, that because of the passage of the state sanctuary law? I, to be honest, I don't really know why that is, but the sanctuary laws, there's like three laws that the state passed that designed to limit uh, cooperation between which counties. Bill Brown was against. Bill Brown was against, um, but they passed in spite of that, and and so the the, uh, the counties had to adjust, and um, you have 98 people um, being turned over to federal authorities as opposed to 350 the previous year. Now Bill Brown was giving sort of a highlight of who they were, and he had like 10 pulled out. And, and if you saw you know, what they were arrested for, they sounded pretty alarming. There was you know, you know, multiple you know, beating up Bob cops, cram. Um, oh. arson, child molest. And a lot of the, the county supervisors are saying, hey, you have 98 people. Um, you're showing us 10. Uh, the, the, the suggestion was that Bill Brown was cherry picking to make them look more ominous than they were. Did How the many? Soup, I mean, these, the soups thought ninety-eight was still too much. You know what? But the three of the supervisors, really, in, in the context of what's been happening in the last year with ICE, the detention facilities in Texas, children being um, separated from their parents, they, they're horrified, and they're horrified as Democrats, but they're also horrified just as human beings, and and so. 
they were, you know. Um, this is the only thing they have some control so over. So Joan Hartman, who is a third district supervisor, is saying, hey. Running for re-election. Running for re-election. She's saying, you know, it's the context of the thing. You know, um, what's going on at the time, uh, you know, immigrants are being vilified you know, so heinously right now that anything that the county does that's in cooperation with ICE perpetuates that. Josh Williams and Greg Hart. Who was he pandering to? Uh, they wasn't pandering, I don't think. I think really... Um, we're supposed to be objective. It's a factual I think, question. I, I think that really, they, they were both... Uh, what, what Josh's point was that this is part of a political strategy to discourage uh, Latinos uh, and immigrants uh, from uh, being counted in the census. And, um, True. And, and the, the, the point that kept coming up was, uh, was that the fear in, in, in Santa Barbara and the immigrant community is so intense now that uh, this past summer there was a 50% reduction in the number of kids who took advantage of free food programs that often target immigrant kids. So the fact that it went down that much this summer when all this stuff is happening came up time and time again. All right. So real, I, real quick, we, we got to get to school board stuff. Uh, school districts screwed up getting reimbursement for 300,000 free breakfast for students last year. What's that about? Yeah, uh, so the free... Another Carrie Mott's woko debacle. <laughs> I mean, it's really honestly a more of a federal government issue the, um, in this case. Matsuoka's messed up a few times, but really in this case... Um, the USDA funded program, Free Breakfast, they reimburse the school based off of how many free breakfasts they serve. Um, but the school has to have a 50% poverty level for that to happen. And if it moves 5% either direction, you have to rebase. Happened with seven schools, but with all three high schools this time. So for in order for students to get their lunch, they have to type in this pin pad. And this created these extremely long, long lines. And over half of the students that normally would get those free meals weren't able to get them they by the time of the fed. bill. Yeah, and so at the end of the year, when it's time to reimburse, half of the revenue's gone. There's a $606,000 deficit. And the money's coming out of the general. For the first time, I mean, at least in over a decade, according to Nancy Weiss, but pr probably much longer than that. It's And kind then of the, a new development in the uh, Fair Education Just Communities case? Yeah, uh, the, the hearing for that was, was pushed to October 17th, but there's they actually have a case now because they have um, five... Fair Education. Yeah, Fair Education actually has a case now. There's um, people who are actually coming forward claiming that the Just Communities curriculum has harmed them. The implicit in some bias uh, yeah, training Yes, uh, supposedly some people are actually harmed, uh, including a 14-year-old who said he felt suicidal as a result and being white, he hates being white so much now he's suicidal it's just, over it. It's not a national <laughs> thing. It's just, we're just a little microcosm here. Let's see where that goes. I wonder though how many people felt like they hated being anything other than white. Right, yeah, it's, it's a fair point. Um, apparently there was also one Latino student though who um, was upset with the training because part of the training was they would have students of color yell out slurs that they had been called. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't any kind of trigger warning for that. So one of the students who did go in actually left crying and upset about it because it brought up a lot of bad memories and they right. asked and to be taken out. That hearing mm -hmm. set for October 15th? October 15th, I yeah. believe, yeah. All right. Okay, well, thanks to Nick Welsh, Josh Molina, Lizzie Rodriguez, and Delaney Smith, and thank you for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, and should your insomnia be particularly troublesome, check out our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and interviews, including our four special programs on the Campaign for City Council, now available in podcast. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Michael Heba, Ryan, and Mark, and as always... Our senior, top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Half Freund, will see you next time on Newsmaker.